I'm going to be talking today about challenges in burning plasma physics. More particularly, I'm going to be talking about challenges in burning plasma physics in magnetic confinement fusion, um, and more specifically, largely in relation to tokamak plasmas. Although quite a few of these challenges and the issues that I'm going to discuss could be applied in a generic way, at least, to stellarity concepts as well. The motivation for my talk is, as Tony Dunne mentioned earlier, the construction of ITER, which is moving forward rapidly uh, at Cadrache, or more strictly saint paul et durance uh, adjacent to the Cadrache site in southern France. Um, you see here a, a recent, uh, let's see if I can get this right. And there we are. You see here a recent aerial view of the, the site showing the advances that have been made in constructing the on-site facilities. And it's anticipated that first plasma will, take, will occur in late 2025. Uh, and this is the Ita Tokamak, which will, the assembly of which will shortly start uh, on, the, on the site. The overall programmatic objective of ITA is to demonstrate the scientific and technological feasibility of fusion energy for peaceful purposes and the principal goal is to design a device, a tokamak, on this scale, which allows the uh, confinement of a DT fusion plasma uh, with a high fusion gain, which will satisfy this objective. And so ITER fundamentally is designed to confine a deuterium tritium plasma in which the alpha particle heating dominates all other forms of plasma heating. And that's what we mean by a burning plasma. I'll come back to this point shortly and define that more quantitatively. But that fundamentally is the, the goal to which, towards, towards which I'm looking. Although beyond that, of course, we want to develop fusion uh, for the production of uh, useful uh, energy. Uh, and Tony, in his talk this morning, showed you how the European roadmap foresees that will happen in the longer term. And again, these issues that I'm going to discuss will apply to a large extent to the devices that come beyond uh, ITER, uh, such as DEMO. So let me just refer briefly uh, to this diagram, which is quite a complicated diagram, and I don't want to go into it in detail. But the content of my talk is largely derived from our analysis in the ITER organization, where I worked until the end of 2017, on what we call the ITER research plan. And this is basically the plan that figures out how we get to where we want to go, put it simply. It develops the programmatic uh, uh, strategy for getting from startup of ITER in late 2025 to the production of useful amounts of fusion energy, which, um, as I will explain briefly, uh, will, is likely to first occur in the late 2030s. I don't want to go through this, as I said, I don't want to go through it in detail, and I've given a reference at the end of the talk to where you can download the text of the ITER research plan, where all of these issues are discussed in more detail. But what I would just want to point out is that following first plasma in 2025, there'll be a period of, of, of all the 10 years in which we will operate ITER without uh, deuterium and tritium, uh, without the production, of, i.e. without the production of fusion energy, without the production of neutrons. Uh, and the, the reason for that is that during this time, because we're going to be upgrading the machine in a staged way towards its full performance, uh, we need to be able to uh, keep the machine unactivated so that we have access to it. And this time scale of 10 years is to a large extent, not entirely, but to a significant extent, influenced by the, the, the basically the budget profile that we have that allows us to um, procure the additional auxiliary systems, particularly heating current drive systems, diagnostic systems, uh, and, so, and the tritium plant, which will allow us to make the transition to full DT operation. So for these first 10 years, we're going to be operating in hydrogen uh, and probably also helium plasmas. Um, the, the actual periods of operation after first plasma uh, are shown in red here, as uh, these, this, these acronyms mean pre-fusion power operation. And a large part of this time is actually involved in upgrading the device. But during this, these periods of operation, there will be an intense research program in order to address some of these issues I'm going to talk about at the ETA scale. There's a very active research program ongoing in the existing devices, and again, 
Uh, I think Tony gave a very good overview of that in the European context in his talk. But we need to be able to extrapolate, or at least confirm the extrapolation to the ether scale. And that's what we'll be doing during these phases. And then ultimately, uh, around 2035, we'll make the transition initially to deuterium operation and then to full DT operation when we start to produce fusion power and gradually build up the amount of fusion power. And so what I'm going to be talking about here is basically the product of the analysis that we carried out to support this strategy or uh, to, to develop this strategy towards producing fusion power in ITER. But it has much wider uh, applications uh, to, any, uh, to, to, to basically any uh, burning plasma and tokamak that the, the rest of the world might think of developing uh, and more generally to magnetic fusion generally. So with that introduction, let me just give you a very brief synopsis of what I'm going to talk about. Firstly, I want to briefly introduce some key concepts in fusion power production, defining what, more quantitatively what we mean by the burning plasma regime. And then I want to talk about some of the key physics challenges and opportunities uh, for burning plasmas. And I divided this very broadly into two categories. Uh, and there's a certain arbitrariness here. One is the, categories, the category of physics constrained by scale and experimental goals. This basically means that to produce significant amounts of fusion power, one has to build a large, high power device. And this brings certain challenges with it. The second aspect is physics accessible only in a burning plasma experiment. And that's fundamentally the physics that comes from the internal alpha particle heating of the plasma. And so this is a very rough division, conceptual division between the different topics I'm going to talk about. But basically integrated, they form the, 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 the overall set of challenges that one needs to address to come up with a consistent, to produce a consistent plasma scenario that will produce um, hundreds of megawatts of fusion power or beyond that uh, to the gigawatts that one wants to produce in a reactor. So let me talk about this first um, issue and introduce some of these key concepts. Now, now I think probably most people here, uh, possibly everyone is aware, that what we're interested here in, in, uh, in our research is fundamentally the deuterium tritium experiment in which uh, uh, nuclei of deuterium and tritium fuse to produce an alpha particle um, which is 20% of the energy of the reaction and which heats the plasma, which produces internal heating of the plasma, and the neutron, which produces 80%. And this graph here on the right is just meant to illustrate the fact that at, at around 10 keV, um, DT is the most favorable experiment for producing significant amounts of fusion power. For the DD reaction, which would be an alternative, um, the red curve here, one needs to get to much higher temperatures in the region of 50 to 100 keV, uh, and, yet, and even there, the cross-section for the DT reaction is perhaps an order of magnitude higher. So DT is the easiest path that we have towards significant fusion power production. I just want to mention one other uh, point on this graph, and that is these other reactions of neutrons with lithium are also very important for the fusion uh, energy production. Um, they're not plasma physics issues, but I introduced them for completeness. Um, we, would use, we would store lithium in the blanket, the so-called breeding blanket, on the wall of a reactor, and the reactions with neutrons would produce additional tritium. Um, and we'll test this concept in ITER as well. So, fusion power production. The message I want to convey here is that, in fact, the fusion power production is dominated by a small population of high-energy ions, or high-energy nuclei, in the plasma, which tunnel through the, the uh, Coulomb barrier uh, of the nuclei and which produce the fusion reactions. Um, for example, for 100 kV nuclei, the tunneling, pro pro tunneling probability is only a few percent. But it's these nuclei which actually produce the fusion reactions. Based on this, it's possible to calculate the fusion cross-section and the fusion power density for an optimal 50-50 DT mixture is given by this equation here. Um, it basically where uh, P is the, the pressure uh, inside the plasma. And so without going into the details of this, for a magnetic fusion reactor, uh, say with a pressure uh, in the core of about 10 atmosphere, the fusion power would give you 7.5 megawatts per meter cubed. So that gives you an idea of, of the way in which these, uh, these numbers scale. Now let's think about the question of the fusion power again because it's not only important to produce fusion, fusion power in significant amounts, we need to produce a significant gain 
if we want to use fusion as a significant source of energy. And so obtaining the temperature required to produce fusion reactions um, requires sufficient input power to the plasma in order to overcome the various loss processes, whether, it, whether it's transport through the plasma, uh, whether it's synchrotron radiation, Bremsstrahlung radiation. These are the fundamental loss processes that we face. The parameter that we use to characterize uh, this energy loss is the energy confinement time, which is very simply defined as being the thermal power stored in the plasma over the, over the loss rate. And this is the, the energy confinement time, which is a key parameter in understanding the quality uh, of confinement and ultimately the fusion potential of a plasma. We can put this into a fusion power balance uh, and calculate what the auxiliary uh, power is that's required to supplement the alpha power from the fusion reactions through this equation. If one solves this, equa this equation rather trivially uh, uh, with uh, setting the auxiliary power equal to zero, i.e. the ignition condition, then one finds that uh, this gives you a, uh, an equation uh, for n tau uh, in, in terms of these parameters. And this then is the basis of the famous Lawson criterion, which was established right back very close to the start of uh, fusion research, which tells us what we need to achieve in order to, to produce significant fusion power, in order to achieve ignition. And for a long time in the program, in the fusion research program, ignition was the key goal and sometimes the holy grail uh, of fusion research. In the, in the decades that, are, that have passed since these initial uh, analyses were made, we've understood that actually ignition is not where we want to be. Um, we'd like to actually have a high fusion gain, a very high fusion gain, um, but ignition may not even be a desirable uh, place to be because uh, when we have a burning plasma, as I'll say, we need to be able to control a burning plasma, and if you're fully ignited, that, that brings its own problems. Uh, and, and in addition, if one wants to operate in a steady state, then one needs probably to have input power as well, particularly in a tokamak, in order to produce the steady state. So this is the original concept. Now, one can actually put numbers in here and calculate what the parameters need to be, but there's actually a, a simpler way that one can reduce these equations, which I want to go on to, uh, which is uh, shown on this slide. One can actually define a parameter, which is the ratio of the alpha particle uh, power to the loss power in the plasma, and which is defined as the ignition margin. Normally, we talk in terms of Q, the ratio of the, if we go back to this slide, we talk in terms of Q, the ratio of the fusion power to the auxiliary power that you're putting in, so that when the auxiliary power goes to zero, as is stated here, then Q goes to infinity. It's, it's, it's a useful concept, um, but anything that goes to infinity it can be rather hard to, 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 to characterize. And so one of, an alternative parameter is this, what this parameter C, which is known as the ignition margin, and it turns out that it's actually very, very simple to express uh, what, uh, what the potential C of a plasma is in terms of some basic parameters, and that's shown here. Basically, C is just proportional to a, a, is a constant proportionality, and it's then the, uh, the dt density, the dt temperature, uh, times the energy confinement time. And this is known as the fusion triple product. And so if you know these parameters, you can calculate what C is. And one can show with a, for some very simple algebra, uh, noting that the fusion power is just five times the alpha power, and that the loss power is just the sum of the auxiliary and alpha power, one finds that C, this ignition margin, is just Q over Q plus five. So from the fusion triple product, one can calculate C very easily, and then one can calculate Q. So this gives us a rather simple means in which to estimate the conditions uh, that correspond to a burning plasma. And what I've shown on this slide is how we take those conditions, uh, doing some simple algebra, um, and calculate how the Q values that we tend to talk about in our everyday um, experimental research relate to this value of C. Uh, I've, I've re, uh, to, to, to emphasize exactly what C means, I've redefined it as this parameter F alpha, uh, which is basically the, the fractional heating power due to alpha particles. And so if one looks at Q equals one, which we normally refer to as break even, that is there's as much power going in as there is fusion power going, coming out, this corresponds to an alpha heating power of 0.17. Q equals five is an alpha heating power of 0.5 and so on to Q equals infinity, where you're, it's 100% alpha heating power. And so quite arbitrarily, 
to some extent, there's no hard, hard boundary, we say that this is the region where we're starting to achieve the parameter regime of a burning plasma. And the reason for that is, if you remember, we originally, I originally defined a burning plasma in words as being a plasma in which the internal processes, and particularly internal heating processes, are dominated by the alpha particles. And so once one gets to the point where the alphas are producing about 50% of the heating power, you're making the transition into that regime. And as you increase the alpha heating power, so the Q um, and the, uh, the uh, increases, and you, become, you enter more deeply into the, into the burning plasma regime. And ether is designed to operate in this regime with Q of 10, or alpha heating power of 67% of the total heating power. Now, this doesn't mean that experiments carried out in this region at Q, around Q equals 1 are of no interest whatsoever or are, are not at all useful. In fact, one can learn, given the, the experiments that we have available, in particular the JET experiment, which is capable of DT, one can learn a great deal about the potential issues or the potential behavior that one is going to have to deal with in a burning plasma by doing experiments uh, in this region. Um, and the experiments that have already been carried out at JET, as was shown by Tony this morning, uh, actually taught us a great deal about how a DT plasma might behave. We learned a great deal about the confinement, about the access to H mode. Um, we learned some things about the uh, fusion driven, uh, the alpha particle driven uh, MHD modes that can occur. And so one can already start to get a, a, a grip on, on some of the issues that we'll need to address more fully in ITER by carrying out experiments even at lower Q in this region. And so the JET-DT experiments in that respect are a very valuable tool. And I'll show actually in the course of this, uh, this talk uh, where JET actually has been very valuable uh, in that respect. So then we can actually ask what are the parameters you need to achieve in order to uh, obtain a significant Q in order to obtain uh, a burning plasma. So one needs to obtain a temperature of around 1 to 200 million uh, Kelvin, i.e. 10 to 20 kV, about 10 times the temperature of the sun's core. One needs a density of about 10 to 20 particles per cubic meter, and that's about a millionth of the particle density in this room. So it's a very tenuous plasma. And one needs an energy confinement time of a few seconds. And that's quite different from the pulse length, of course, which can be thousands of seconds. Uh, we heard this morning in, in Maciem Jakubowski's talk that uh, uh, Wenderstein 7X aims to achieve 30 minute uh, discharges. Um, but the energy confinement time, which characterizes the loss processes, um, is typically in our existing experiments less than a second, and is expected at the ETA scale to be several seconds. And that's the sort of number that one needs for significant fusion gain. And one then has, um, putting these numbers in, calculating nt tau and using this trivial equation of q over nt tau is proportional to q over q plus five, um, one, can, one can determine what different uh, devices will achieve. So our existing devices such as JET are limited from their performance to a q of, of order one or just below one. Ether is designed to achieve a q of 10. There's, um, a, term, there's a, a region which is known as controlled ignition that is not q of infinity but a large q which is where we expect a reactor such as DEMO to operate, and that's a Q of about 30. And you can calculate what needs to be achieved uh, just through this simple, this simple uh, equation derived from the, from the fusion power balance. And this shows the progress that we've made in this over the course of the fusion research in Tokamak, starting with T3 in the late 1960s, uh, to the JET DT, JET and TFTR DT experiments, and the deuterium experiments on GT60U, uh, where we achieved uh, an NT tau. This shows a graph of NT tau, the fusion triple product, plotted against the central line temperature, um, where this is 10 kV. Um, and so in these large, this generation of large uh, tokamaks, uh, we've achieved uh, roughly, uh, roughly uh, uh, Q of order one. And so we're within, the NT tau that we've achieved is within an order of magnitude, is less than an order of magnitude away from where we need to be uh, to produce a significant Q in ITER. Uh, and that's important because it means a lot of the experiments that we carry out in our existing devices can shed a lot of insight into the physics uh, that we'll experience in ITER. So let's turn now to some of the challenges uh, that we need to deal with uh, in, in, a, in a burning plasma. And 
uh, as I said in my introduction, I'm thinking particularly here about ITER, um, because the analysis has been carried out looking forward to the operation of ITER. But many of the issues I'm going to talk about are equally valid for extrapolation beyond ITER uh, to demo. Uh, and even in a generic sense, as I said, if we ended up building a stellar ITER demo, quite a few of these issues, uh, there's one or two in particular which wouldn't be uh, relevant, but many of these issues uh, would be generically similar in a stellar ITER. Let's think firstly what's different about burning plasma physics uh, and the operation of a device. In a burning plasma, which is which the heating is dominated by alpha particles, the nonlinearity in the total heating power due to the dependence on plasma profiles um, brings in some very interesting new physics. Remember that the fusion power, uh, local fusion power, is proportional to the pressure squared, and so that means as the pressure profile changes, so the fusion power changes, and so one can have nonlinear interactions. Uh, that one doesn't have in existing devices. One can also have MHD generated by the, the alpha particles. Salt teeth can be stabilized by energetic particles. Uh, on the other hand, as I'll show, there's a whole range of MHD which can be destabilized by the uh, uh, alpha particles. Because of the large energies involved, uh, plasma con and because of the scale of the devices, plasma control um, can become challenging because the time scales to make things happen uh, particularly inside the plasma, become timescales of, of order seconds, whereas some of the MHD instabilities one needs to deal with uh, can have growth times uh, very much less than a second. Um, so uh, certainly tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds. So one needs to develop very careful control schemes in order to be able to deal with that and to anticipate problems. And it makes also for a very complex control matrix. As I said, there's very high stored energy. So that means transients uh, give you very high loadings, energy loadings on the first wall components. So phenomena such as disruptions, which I'll mention briefly, and elms can lead to significant energy deposition on the first wall components. And one needs to take action to mitigate uh, those transient energy events. The high plasma current means that in disruptions in particular, you can have significant runaway electron generation. And that's a problem in its own right, which we are uh, which we're working very intensively on at ITER. And finally, the high ion influence. This was an issue that was mentioned in Maciej Jakubowski's talk. Uh, the high ion influence uh, brings its own problems in terms of the erosion of the PFCs uh, and the lifetime of the PFCs. So as we move into this bonding plasma regime, there's, problem, there's issues not only in challenges, not only in the core plasma, but also in the area of plasma wall interactions. In the plasma wall interactions area, the power handling area, um, as, as was shown very well, I think, by the last speaker, um, it becomes in itself a major issue for burning plasmas. So the key physics issues I'm going to talk about are first I'm going to introduce the either key to plasma scenarios uh, and say something about the control uh, of these scenarios, um, say something about the scaling of transport and confinement to the reactor scale, talk about some aspects of MHD stability, uh, and, and finally touch on these power and particle exhaust issues. And then, in terms of the physics accessible only in the burning plasma experiment, i.e. the physics related to the alpha particles, I'm going to talk principally about this issue of, of alpha particle physics and how, in particular, it affects MHD stability in the plasma. Now, I'm going to pull out a few highlights from each of these areas. Uh, they are much deeper uh, and much more extensive than I have time to talk about here. Um, and I've given you a number of references at the end, in particular, the ETA research plan, where these issues are discussed in considerably more detail. So let's talk about plasma control. Now the issue, the fundamental issue of plasma control is that a magnetically confined plasma is a complex state and it cannot be created and sustained without a sophisticated feedback control system. And in particular, there's a great deal of free energy uh, in a magnetically confined plasma. And this free energy can give rise to uh, a wide variety of, of instabilities inside the plasma. Uh, the small scale, um, uh, millimeter, centimeter, even centimeter scale, we refer to this as turbulence. Uh, the, the modes tend to be incoherent, whereas at the larger scale, um, we refer to them as magnetohydrodynamic instabilities. And all of these instabilities can reduce plasma confinement. They can also lead to termination of the plasma. And so we have to deal with this, uh, in particular the larger instabilities. We've been developing uh, active control schemes for, controlling, for, for suppressing them. In a thermonuclear plasma, we need to develop control to uh, hold the plasma burn point to make sure that the plasma power is sustained. 
One thing I should say is that uh, any failures of the control scheme tend to extinguish the plasma, uh, which is, can be advantageous, but if it extinguishes it too rapidly and leads to too high loads, thermal and electromagnetic loads on, on the first of all components, plasma facing components, that in itself can be problematic. Um, one point I should say about the plasma burn is one can work out based on the, the parametric behavior of the confinement time, whether the burn uh, in, in a given device is likely to be stable. And based on our present understanding of confinement, we predict that the burn in ether should be stable. That is, it won't tend to run away. We don't need active control to stop it running away. Now, of course, once the alpha particles get into the plasma in significant uh, densities, it might be that that will impact on the confinement, and it might be that that, uh, that will change. And that's one of the issues uh, we will need to address. So let me just uh, very quickly start, uh, give you an idea of the, the ETA control system. We have a system of about 50 large-scale measurement systems. So, um, there's thousands of data channels from these measurement systems that measure temperature, density, plasma position, um, various aspects of the uh, impurity emission, uh, total radiation, and so on, neutron emission. Um, and these are fed, many of these uh, systems are fed into the plasma control system, uh, which controls about 20 parameters simultaneously. Uh, this number comes from the fact that the number of actuators that we have in terms of heating current drive systems, uh, magnetics, uh, magnetic control systems, uh, fueling systems, vacuum systems, um, are, are about 20 in total. And so we can control about 20 parameters simultaneously. And that's, quite, that's much more extensive than existing devices. But this is necessary in a burning plasma for the reasons I've outlined previously. And so the development of the control system and demonstrating that these more complex control uh, systems and al control algorithms work reliably and effectively uh, is a big part of the, the ongoing research. And so these, this control system ensures that the physics objectives of any discharge are met, which is obviously an important aspect, but they also provide the first level of machine protection and we have deeper levels of protection behind that. There are a number of different plasma scenarios which we see in ITER as the design scenarios. Now, there's a lot of research going on in the existing uh, fusion program, which is looking at various, um, let's say, more sophisticated or more advanced forms of some of these scenarios. Um, we've tried to design ITER with a significant amount of flexibility, particularly in terms of the heating current drive systems, so that whatever we learn in terms of uh, um, high confinement scenarios, for example, in existing devices, we can apply to ITER. And so these design basis scenarios are not necessarily uh, a statement that these are the scenarios that we're going to, to run in ITER and these are the scenarios that are going to produce high fusion power. They provide conceptual guidelines as to how we go about achieving high fusion power and they give us the basic framework in order to be able to design a device like ITER. So there's the, what we call the LMH mode, and I'll say more about this. Uh, which is a basis of high Q operation and, and is a very well characterized uh, scenario in existing devices. There's a so called improved H mode, um, uh, which is or sometimes is now also a super H mode, as refer referred to by, by Tony. This is a development of the H mode, which, which could actually have the potential for improving ETA performance or for allowing us to go to longer pulses. The challenge is to, to characterize. Now, in existing devices, what you have to do in ETA to make sure that you can produce this scenario. And then there's this so-called advanced scenarios, which is the scenario we foresee as, as potentially being the basis of steady state operation. There's still an ongoing discussion in the fusion program as to whether a fusion reactor core needs to operate steady state. There are pros and cons in that respect. The Stellarator has the advantage that it can operate intrinsically in steady state. Um, from the engineering point of view, there are certainly advantages in steady state, but pulsed operations not, uh, not excluded. Nevertheless, our ultimate goal in the, in the Sogamac program is to produce a, a burning plasma scenario that can operate in steady state. And so we have some ideas about how to go about that, as I'll say. I just have to watch my time here. So just to give you an idea of the ETA design scenarios, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but the LMH mode is meant to operate around 15 mega amperes, the hybrid operation in the region of 12 to 14, um, because it has 
typically higher confinement, so can operate at lower current. And the steady state is at somewhat lower current, uh, around um, 9 mega amperes. Uh, and this, this implies that it needs to have significantly higher power to achieve uh, fusion gain. And sorry, it needs to have significantly higher confinement time to achieve uh, fusion gain. In addition to this, there's a range of non-active scenarios. This, these 10 years of operation I showed you before mean we need to develop a range of scenarios to learn how to, how to, to run ITER. And this is true of any fusion device. We, we, we don't turn on our devices at the highest possible current on the first plasma. And so in, in ITER, but we often design them for operation at the highest current. And it means it can, we then have to learn how to get to these highest currents. Let me just say something about the H mode operation. This is a well-known uh, regime in, in devices, existing devices. Basically, it comes about, with, there are two basic regimes in talking about plasmas, the L mode and the H mode. And the difference is that in the H mode, quite spontaneously, a pedestal appears in the plasma profiles right at the very edge, in a region of a few centimeters at the edge. And this leads to a significant increase in the energy content of the plasma as shown here, um, and an increase of about a factor of two in the confinement time. There's a phenomenon that's observed. These are temperature traces, energy traces, and um, spectroscopic traces from a discharge in jet, and you see these fluctuations. And these fluctuations are caused by a phenomenon known as edge localized modes, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment. But these are uh, characteristic of edge modes in existing devices, which help to hold the regime in steady state. They're rather benign, or stationary conditions, I shouldn't say steady state. They're rather benign in existing devices. But as I say in ITER, they're much more challenging. This shows a simulation of, a, of such a regime in, in ITER operating at uh, 500 megawatts uh, for several hundred seconds. I just wanted to show you the calculated profiles. So the central temperatures are of order 30 kilovolts. The average temperature is around 10 kilovolts in, in these. Uh, and the plasma density is just under 10 to 20 particles per cubic meter. But these are simulations and the physics basis that we've developed uh, in existing devices is the basis for that. Let me say something about the steady state operation. This is a much more challenging uh, and is likely to remain challenging for quite some quite considerable time. It's rather uh, more sophisticated, more, more complex, or as people normally say, advanced than the LMH mode. It's based on the idea that in a plasma with sufficient uh, central shear, i.e. magnetic shear, so that you have a, a hollow, if you will, a hollow current profile, um, plus sufficient rotational shear, an internal transport barrier can form. So we have the edge transport barrier for the edge mode, and you can actually see an internal transport barrier forming. Uh, again, it seems to be rather spontaneous under these conditions, and this leads to enhanced confinement and allows one with the enhanced confinement to reduce the current, op the, reduce the current for operation. One also gains from a large bootstrap fraction. This is an internal driven current. I, I don't have time to discuss it here, but one gets, you, one gets something for free, if one likes, if you want to put it that way. If you can make sure that the current's well aligned for MHD stability and the confinement enhancement, this offers the route to steady state operation at lower, at lower input power than, than uh, the LMH mode does. The penalty one pays for this is that one needs very, uh, very reliable active MHD control. And so there's a great deal of work going on at the moment to develop an integrated plasma scenario with reactor element parameters that could be extrapolated to ITER. And my suspicion is that because of the complexity of this, that ITER itself will be an experiment in achieving steady state operation. And this is a simulation of a steady state um, plasma in, in ITER. The thing I want to draw your attention to here is this is the axis of the plasma in this case, and this is the hollow current profile that comes from, from the combination of the bootstrap current and the external current drive. And it's this hollow current pro profile which leads to reverse magnetic shear that contributes to the enhanced confinement. But I should say that in ITER we aim to achieve a Q of about five. That's what we think might be achievable. In a reactor, we want to achieve a Q of order 25. So even, so ITER really only provides the basis uh, for demonstrating that such regimes are consistent with burning plasmas. So this is the, one of, the, one of the, the, the key challenges for ITER, demonstrating that steady state operation is consistent with a burning plasma and understanding what the basic physics is so that one can extrapolate it to say demo. Um, let me uh, pass over the, the details of this. I simply want to make a point that the way in which we extrapolate from existing experiments 
to ITER is we use scaling because the, the transport processes and existing devices are driven by turbulence, which we can't calculate from first principles at the moment. And so we've used the, the uh, accumulated data that we have from our existing experiments to put together a scaling from the existing experiments to ITER, which is, um, predicts that the ITER uh, confinement time should be in the region of three to four. And so one of the issues that we need to deal with, of course, is that ITER will have to demonstrate that this scaling is actually uh, reliable at the ITER scale. To, to summarize for you, uh, basically the confinement time depends on the plasma current. So large current is, gives you a large confinement time. The major radius squared, and this explains why we keep making our tokamaks bigger, why well, ETA is twice as big as jet, and it falls off as the power to the uh, minus two thirds, which is a helpful burn control uh, aspect. The, I just want to make a point about the, the, the edge mode, and that is that we've done a lot of work, we've done, carried out a lot of research on the basic physics of the edge mode, and it's, it's thought to be uh, created in the, in the edge region. Um, in terms of the uh, rotational shear suppression of E cross B turbulence. But again, we don't have a good quantitative basis for calculating, so we use scaling. And this shows results from the first set of jet DT experiments and indicates the importance of these DT experiments because it allowed us to see what the, what the uh, dependence of the H mode threshold was on the isotopic mass, and it turned out to be inversely proportional. And this, this is an important result uh, for our research in burning plasmas because it says that the um, it's easier to get into the H mode in DT plasmas than it is in deuterium or hydrogen plasmas. And that was a very important result that came out of the JET experiments. I won't go into this in detail. On the basis of all these experiments carried out both at JET and around the world, we have a good basis for the confinement time scaling and the H mode access uh, scaling. Um, MHD stability and plasma operational limits is, is the second major issue I want to talk about. As I said, the free energy drives a lot of instabilities. Um, and so the theory that describes these instabilities is magnetohydrodynamic theory, which gives a good qualitative and to a significant extent quantitative description uh, of, what, uh, of the uh, stability limits uh, and the associated instabilities. There are two basic types of instabilities, ideal instabilities, which produce field line bending and grow, can grow very rapidly, and resistive instabilities, which cause tearing reconnection of magnetic field lines, and the formation of magnetic island shown in this cross section here. And we're developing plasma control techniques to suppress the most significant instabilities so that we can operate stable plasmas in the face of these various forms of instabilities. I'm not going to go into the plasma operational limits. I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that there are a number of different operational limits which we have to address, and the plasma control system has to maintain the plasma at a sweet spot in the middle of these operating limit, operational limits in order to maintain high fusion power. One of the instability techniques that we're developing is uh, the stabilization of so-called neoclassical tearing modes. Neoclassical tearing modes are, are driven by the, the bootstrap current um, th through the use of electron cyclotron current drive in the magnetic island. So you see here an experiment in D3D in which ECCD, this is a signal showing the growth of a magnetic island. ECCD was applied to the uh, center of the island and suppressed uh, the, uh, the island while the ECCD was applied. And th this is being applied to ITER. We have four, we'll have four upper launches to do exactly this. And so this is just one example I give of the success that we're having in the research program in controlling these instabilities. One issue I should talk about is disruptions, vertical displacement events, and runaway electrons. Basically, a disruption results from the sudden growth um, of, of a large MHD instability, um, which is presumed to occur at this point here. Um, typical chain of events is that it causes decay in the plasma energy initially, then a rapid decay, which can occur on a millisecond time scale. You can lose, um, in jet, for example, megajoules of energy uh, on a time scale of, uh, of a millisecond. This, the cooling of the plasma then leads to a rapid current decay, and the high voltage produced can then lead to generation of runaway electrons. So we have high thermal loads, we have high electromagnetic loads, and we have runaway electrons generated in disruptions. And so basically the answer to this is to develop effective disruption detection, avoidance schemes, 
and ultimately runaway mitigation, uh, disruption mitigation. We have to be able to suppress or, or mitigate the worst effects of the disruptions. And that's, uh, as I think Tony's illustration of the NICE uh, experiments being done on jet with the shattered pellet injection are part of the program to address this. And it's very nice to see those experiments going ahead. This shows an early example of this disruption mitigation in which simply high, argon, high pressure argon gas was injected in order to generate a controlled disruption. And this leads to a significant reduction in the so-called halo currents, which characterize the vertical forces associated with the disruption. Um, now, we think that probably gas injection won't, uh, won't succeed in ether, and this is why the shattered pellet injection is being pursued. Um, so we're looking at delivery methods. We're looking at the... One has to consider the balance between runaway electron generation and suppression because injecting impurities, as we do here, can enhance the generation of runaway electrons. And so it's a very fine balance as to how you, how you achieve the runaway electron suppression that's needed. And we do need very effective disruption detection and avoidance schemes uh, associated with this. Um, let me say something briefly about diverters. In fact, a good part of what I want to say was actually dealt with very, very elegantly and very thoroughly uh, by Maciej Jakubowski in his talk. He answered the question that I wanted to pose here, why do we use a, use a diverter? And he explained this very well, it reduces impurity contamination, it exhausts helium effectively from the fusion reactions, and it produces this magnetic X point in the magnetic configuration, which gives us access to the H mode. However, it brings with it uh, a price which has to be paid. Um, in particular, if one looks at the energy power balance in a reactor such as ITER, um, with 50 megawatts of input power, 500 megawatts of fusion power, so 100 megawatts of alpha power, and only 30 megawatts of core radiation, it means there's 120 megawatts flowing into the scrape-off layer around the plasma. And 90% of this power flows then into the diverter. And if we did nothing to, mit to, to mitigate this, we'd end up with powers flowing, flow of densities flowing along the field lines of, of, of order gigawatt per meter squared, uh, as, as the machine said. Um, the, the average power on the surface would be of order 40 megawatts per meter squared. Uh, and as, as Tony pointed out, the, the, the power at the density at the surface of the sun is 70 megawatts per meter squared. So we're, we're within a factor of two of that. So clearly this is, a major, uh, this is a major issue that needs to be dealt with. And developing the sorts of components that can handle that is a major challenge. Um, and in a reactor, the exhaust power we'd have to deal with, it could be three to five times higher. So beyond data, the, the challenge is even more serious. So we need to, to deal with this, and particularly because water-cooled targets, engineered water-cooled targets, are limited to about 10 megawatts per meter squared, 10, maybe 15, but there, there are pretty hard engineering limits around there, uh, around that factor. And so what we do is we exploit a number of factors, as again, very well explained this morning by by um, Mary Machin, we exploit the magnetic field geometry, the so-called flux expansion, we exploit the balance between the uh, perpendicular and parallel transport in the scrape-off layer to reduce the plasma temperature, but a critical part of what we do is the injection of hydrogenic and, and impurity gases in order to enhance the radiation. The figure of 30 megawatts I quoted before was for the intrinsic core radiation. If we enhance the radiation, it means that we can uh, increase uh, the isotropic part of the power that's coming out of the plasma. Also increasing the density increases the ion neutral collisions and therefore also dissipates power. And so we can actually, re and, and then we can get into this so-called detached plasma regime or detached diverter regime in which the power flowing on the, uh, on the diverter targets is very much reduced. And this just shows a very nice example of this in ASDEX upgrade uh, with a high radiation um, in the diverter area, which reduces the power flux to the diverter target. And this is the basic technique that we intend to use in ITER. Thank you. I just want to mention this issue of ELM control. As I said, in existing devices, ELM, ELMs are benign uh, and help to maintain the plasma in quasi-stationary conditions. In ITER, the pulses of energy associated with ELMs can be as large as, uh, as, five, gig, as five megajoules. Um, and if that impacts on first wall components, that can lead to significant enhancement of erosion of the first wall components. So we have to mitigate the elms um, by more than an order of magnitude. And so one of the, uh, there's two ways of doing this. One is through magnetic perturbations in the plasma edge. This shows an example in D3D where the elms have been suppressed by magnetic perturbations or by elm pest baking 
and to increase the frequency of the elms, which can be achieved by pellet injection, such as NASDAQ's upgrade. And in the ITER, uh, we're installing a set of magnetic coils, so-called RMP coils, dedicated to, the, to applying the magnetic perturbations. And we'll also have a number of different pellet injectors to allow us to, to, look at, to, to investigate pellet pacemaking. And, that, um, and, and that's our approach to uh, controlling the elms and controlling the transient heat loads from elms. Um, as was discussed this morning by Tony, um, we will use all metallic walls, beryllium on the first wall, tungsten and diverter. It may be in a reactor, it probably will be in a reactor that if we have metal walls, we'll use tungsten also on the first wall, and ultimately in ITER we may have tungsten on the first wall. This brings its own set of, uh, of, of challenges, which I've actually listed in the backup slides, and I can invite you to have a look there. Um, and these are being investigated in particular in experiments like JET, ASDEX upgrade, um, where they have all metallic walls. Let me say something just before I close on the alpha particle driven uh, instabilities. Uh, this is something, uh, one, one could talk a lot about alpha particle confinement and the possible loss processes, but the thing I'll concentrate on is the alpha particle driven instabilities. The point is that as these alpha particles slow down, they can interact with the, the sea of alphane modes that are normally stable in our plasmas. There's a sea of alphane modes uh, which could potentially go in, in tokamak plasmas, but it turns out that for the conditions of normal thermal plasmas uh, in our existing devices, they're basically stable. But the additional energy, because the alpha particles have a velocity, uh, which is of order of the alphane velocity, they can interact with these alphane modes and can drive them unstable. And in fact, there's a whole zoo of these modes, I'm not going into this in detail, which have been uh, observed in our existing experiments caused by, because different, fact, different aspects of the plasma equilibrium lead to bands opening up where the, alpha, where the alphane modes can become unstable. And so we've observed these driven by, for example, neutral beam injected uh, um, fast particles in existing devices, um, and they're expected to be driven unstable by, by the alpha particles. Could we come to the summary, please? Yes, yeah, I'm going to come to that. So I just wanted to say that basically the, the distribution function of the alpha particles uh, can drive these modes unstable. And the interesting thing about the burning plasma is that the nonlinear behavior can lead to redistribution of the alpha particles. And that's the key, one of the key aspects of the burning plasmas that we want to investigate in either how the uh, alpha and eigen modes affect the alpha particles. So to summarize, what I've basically just touched on briefly here is that um, the extensive physics studies that were carried out in existing devi devices, which was summarized rather nicely also by Tony this morning in the European context, has given us a very good physics basis for the, uh, development, for the development of both of the e-design and of the ETA research plan. Going by, by developing the research plan and, and um, uh, basically envisaging how we're going to go from plasma startup to the production of high fusion power in ETA, we've identified a still significant number of issues which we have to improve our where we have to improve our understanding in order to make efficient use of the of the ETA machine and in order to uh, ensure that we can reliably produce high fusion power and these issues provide additional motivation for the ongoing research program and the final point i want to make is that the successful exploitation of ETA will not only realize the limitless possibilities of fusion energy but it's going to open up a whole new area uh, of fusion plasma physics. Um, and I think this is the exciting, uh, the exciting uh, uh, vision that we have uh, going down the next few years, that ITER is going to give us access to new physics beyond that that we can explore in our existing devices. And I think it, the, the ITER operation phase will be a ex very exciting era for those who are active in fusion research at that time. Apologize for overrunning, but thanks very much for your. Uh, Thank you very much for this excellent interview lecture. <laughs> since, since the time limit is over, we have only one or two short questions, please. Okay. Um, what? <laughs> Thank you very much for your very nice talk. I, I have one question. I think in these large machines like ETA with a um, extremely high energy fluxes. You need, for example, also for L mitigation uh, by pellets, you need a lot of impurities which you have to inject uh, to, uh, um, to dissipate uh, the energy by radiation. Yes. Are you limited, for, especially for, uh, for um, pellets, 
to do it really locally. You, I think you cannot in, introduce an infinite amount of impurities locally because the plasma cools down and don't accept it. Do you have then to distribute around the the, the, the pellet injection systems, the, 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 the high-frequency pellet injection systems we have are basically designed to inject um, deuterium or tritium. Um, the impurities uh, that we will inject to, to radiate, to mitigate the power as much as possible, uh, will be uh, gas-fueled through the diverter, basically. It can also be done in the main chamber, um, but uh, experiments on existing devices have shown that the screening in the, uh, for, for purity injection in the main chamber is not as effective, so we expect to inject impurities through the diverter. Um, but I take your point. It's, it's this, this issue of integrating the, the, the edge and the behavior at the edge with the fusion power production in the core and how one strikes the right balance is going to be one of the key experimental aspects of the experimental program in, in ITER. The last question, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, very nice overview. Uh, I have a question concerning the MHD activity control with the, this advanced scenario and a bootstrap current. I, I, I always kind of really difficult to, to imagine that in, in the plasma where plasma is self-organized to such extent that the current density profile is self-organized. How do you plan to actually make this MHD activity control where you do not know where your uh, locked modes can develop to which uh, radius of the plasma? Uh, this, is, this is actually a very good uh, question, I think. The, um, we, we have a, we, I think we have a pretty good grasp of, of the control, type of control algorithms we would apply in so-called inductive operation. The advanced scenario is much more problematic. Even if you can get into this regime in the first place, um, it's prone to different, uh, different regimes of MHD instability, as you say, from the inductive uh, phase. Um, we might be lucky and the, the um, natural current profile might turn out to be close to stable, in which case we just have to nudge it around a bit. But one of the big issues in developing these, these scenarios, which will need to be addressed much, much more intensively in existing devices and will also be part of the, the ITER experimental program, is exactly how much margin you have against these instabilities, whether you can come up, whether you can establish the same, uh, to the same extent, reliable algorithms for detecting the growth of instabilities and suppressing them. The, the, the concern I have, and uh, I think this, this is what you refer to, is that in these types of, uh, these types of uh, regimes, particularly with the reverse shear, um, they could be much more prone to ideal MHD, and that'd be much more rapidly growing. Uh, and if that's the case, then it's much more challenging to, to address that. One, needs to, one then needs to have a program in which one develops the plasma ab initio and maintains it in, in stable conditions. And with given what I said about the timescales for control in ITER, that's going to be very challenging. So, so the viability of, of steady state scenarios in the burning plasma regime uh, for a tokamak is by, no means, uh, is, is by no means a done deal. I think there's, a, there's still a great deal uh, of research that has to be done. A lot can be done in existing devices, but once you introduce the alpha particles, then that's an additional complication. So uh, your point is well taken. It's, it's a, it is a major challenge for Tokamak. Uh, okay, thank devices. you once again for 